Any questions about anything before we start? Questions? Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, have your prelims back for you today. Unfortunately, I, I'm, <laughs> I was going to record the grades manually while I was at lunch, but the Wi-Fi was out in Cafe Pacific, so here I am, and I've, I've gotten up through L. So just writing down abbreviations for your names, you know, like Drakowitz is Drake. Um, <laughs> Freeman is free, you know, that kind of thing. And so what I'll do during the break, I'll finish recording them. And then if, if we get to a convenient stopping point, I'll stop the class a little early and hand out the test so you can ask me questions if you want. Otherwise, just hand them out at the end. As far as the scores go, I, the, they're very similar to last year, it seems to me. I think the mean's going to be around 80-ish, maybe, a little below. One person got 100. Um, the lowest scores were in the mid-50s, which is not like D, so it's, it's above that. So you're not, no one's in danger of getting below a C- minus yet. Okay, yet. The minimum score you could have gotten is 2, because when I <laughs> sat down to do this, and you guys, I, Balaj and, and Tamid last night ran into me at CTV, and I was sitting there with this pile of exams. And what I had fully intended to do was grade the exams at CTV last night, or at least get two-thirds of the way through them. So I, I was doing the answer sheet, and I got to this one problem that I couldn't do. And I thought, wait a minute, what was I thinking? You know, like, and, and I actually could not, I still don't know the answer to the question. It's one of the true-false. I still don't know the answer. So I gave everyone credit for that, no matter what, what they put. I figured it was, it was only fair. What's that? <laughs> Yay. <laughs> but no, no one got a two. So that's good news. OK, any other questions? Now that we've answered the prelim question. Yeah. It's on a Wednesday of approximately that date. So if, if the Wednesday is that week is the 18th, yeah. yeah. It's the Wednesday before the week of Thanksgiving. Any other questions? OK. Now we're talking about these Fourier transforms once again. And we have these two equations. I just want to. Always have them available. To point at. OK, so recall we were talking about the Fourier transforms. And last week, we talked about the, the definition of the Fourier transform, some existence criteria, that kind of thing. Last time, we talked about three important operational rules. The time shift rule, the frequency shift rule, and the convolution rule. And at the end of class last time, I showed you how the Frequency shift rule gives us at least a little bit of a preliminary grip on why the Fourier transform <coughs> reflects the frequency content of a signal, one that we expect to have frequency content. So we used the frequency shift rule <coughs> to analyze <coughs> the finite duration A440. And the point of that is that is a signal that we think of as having frequency content around 440 hertz. Question, does its Fourier transform reflect that fact? Answer, yes. It turns out if you use the frequency shift rule and use the example we had of a pulse going to a sync function in frequency, we found that the Fourier transform of at least one elementary finite duration A440 was focused around omega equals plus and minus 2 pi times 440. So yeah, the Fourier transform does reflect frequency content. So saw that the F transform <coughs> reflected 
the frequency content, at least intuitively. And I think we actually talked about that example last spring in, in my version of 2200. I don't know whether you did it in the other ones. Okay, so now I want to pick up from there. I want to talk about some generalities about Fourier transforms as signals and functions. And then I want to talk about using them to analyze LTI systems. And that will lead us to the notion of ideal filters and all that kind of thing. So here's some general properties of Fourier transforms. And again, you're going to see this, this kind of yin and yang going on between Fourier transforms and the signals that accompany them. And this is a very qualitative statement, two, actually two qualitative statements. It turns out that if you have a sharp slash focused signal, so in the time domain, then that's going to have a Fourier transform that's kind of mushy and spread out in the frequency domain. And the yang that goes with that yin, as you might imagine, is that if you have something that's sharp and focused in the omega domain, it's going to correspond to something that's mushy and spread out in the time domain. Now, there's a couple of really extreme examples of that. Anybody care to hazard a guess of what I mean by those? It's ones that we've seen already. Yeah, the ultimate in sharpness and focusness is a delta. So here's some extreme examples. Delta, the ultimate in sharp and focused, goes with one, the ultimate in mushy and spread out, whereas one, mushy and spread out, goes with two pi delta. So that's the, the real kind of extreme version of that. But this holds in general. This holds in general for, for smooth signals and whatever. And, and it has a relationship with physics. Okay, so I'm glad Zach's here today so I can talk about this. <laughs> and see, see if you can set me straight if I say anything stupid, okay? Because anyway. Okay, now this is related to something called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which you've all heard of, I'm sure, and that's in quantum mechanics. Okay, so how does this go? What, what does the Heisenberg uncertainty principle say? The Heisenberg, and there, there, there are various levels of it, okay? So the, the, the most kind of colloquial, whole plaza level, the kind you can talk about with an architecture art and planning student version of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is that you can't measure the position and the velocity of an electron accurately at the same time, okay? If you can measure the position accurately, you can't measure the velocity accurately. If you measure the velocity accurately, or, or momentum equivalently to velocity, you can't measure the position accurately. That's one version. And a slightly more sophisticated version, in fact, more, much more sophisticated, is that if you've got an electron, velocity and position, the, the position of the electron, the velocity of the electron, those aren't meaningful things a priori, okay? that really uh, an electron has uh, some probability distribution over velocities and some probability distribution over, over, over positions. And that's all you know about any given electron, right? And, and so velocity and momentum, or, or position and momentum are not really meaningful quantities to associate with an electron. And even more sophisticated version of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is there is no electron. Okay, it's just, the, the universe is just one big mass of quantum entanglement, and all there are are these sort of floating probability distributions everywhere, and, you know, it's, matter is just a convenient way of organizing that for us. 
Now, is this fair, what I'm saying so far? OK, now I think the most sophisticated version of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is this. You just have to be silent. You know, that's how cool quantum mechanics is. We can't understand it. OK, I think Feynman, I think it was Feynman who said that uh, anybody who thinks they really understand quantum mechanics doesn't understand it at all. OK, so that's, that's basically what's going on. Well, anyway, let, let's go back to that second most sophisticated version of the, or second most elementary statement of it, that says that there's a probability distribution over positions and a probability distribution over momenta associated with every electron. OK, and, and where does that probability distribution come from? Well, it comes from something in quantum mechanics called the wave function. OK, so an electron, let's, let's not be silent and let's not say there's no electron. An electron has associated with it these things that are called wave functions. And these are complex valued things that satisfy various versions of what's called the Schrodinger equation. Another German thing, by the way. Heisenberg also was either German or Austrian. I forget. I think he was German. <clears throat> OK, has, has associated with these things. And every attribute has a wave function associated with it. So it has a position wave function. A momentum wave function, and so on. OK. And how are these wave functions associated with this idea of a probability distribution over positions in a momenta? The magnitudes or the, the, the magnitude squared, so the magnitude of the wave function squared normalized somehow. So it has integral 1, roughly speaking, is like a probability density. Notice that we have to go magnitude squared because we need a non-negative thing here to be a probability density of possibilities for the relevant, relevant attribute. So if you take the position wave function, magnitude squared normalized, that's like the probability distribution over possible positions of the electron. If you do that for the momentum wave function, same thing. OK, so far so good? Is that about right? I, I, want, you know, I want you to catch me. You know, physics is not my forte. All right, now the cool thing, it turns out, and I'm saying this crudely, but accurately enough, that the position wave function and the momentum wave function, whoops, there goes a perfectly good half piece of chalk. Our Fourier transform pair. And this is modulo some constants and whatever, but and notice that we, we don't have anything associated with frequency here. We, we have to use a momentum variable to play the role of the frequency variable and the position variable to play the role of time. You know, we're, we're talking in this course about time and frequency. In physics, they talk about position momentum. T means position and omega means momentum in this case. So what does this say? What does is, what is the crude thing up there above say? It says sharp and focus in the time domain. Well, in the case of quantum mechanics, that's going to be a sharp and focused probability distribution over possible positions. Namely, a good read on what the position of the electron is. Is going to correspond with mushy and spread out in the omega domain. That means that the probability distribution over momenta is going to be mushy and spread out. You don't have a good idea of what the momentum is. And vice versa. If you have a sharp and focused momentum wave function, which gives you, which means that you have a pretty good idea of what the momentum is, you have a lousy idea of what the position is. Okay? And you can actually quantify this. And there's in the monograph there's a there's a, a like a little theorem known as Heisenberg's inequality that that puts some quantitativeness to this. Okay? So to sum it up, sharp position, wave function 
means accurate knowledge of position goes along with a mushy momentum wave function, which is roughly speaking a bad idea of momentum value, and vice versa. Okay, so that, that's an example of where Fourier transforms even play a role in physics. And there, one of the operational rules in the monograph is something called the scaling rule for physical for Fourier transforms. We're not going to put a lot of emphasis on that for now. So the scaling rule for Fourier transforms goes like this. If x has Fourier transform x hat, then for any a bigger than zero, the signal y with specification y of t equals x of a t for all t has Fourier transform y hat with specification y hat of omega equals 1 over a x hat of omega over a. And writing that rule in our sort of informal style, the kind that you would see in the Fourier transform table, This might be the way you've seen it before. <clears throat> People will write x of a t goes with 1 over a x hat of omega over a. And you can symmetrize that a little bit by multiplying through by a square root of a. And this is actually how it comes up in the theory of wavelets, which is the next time we'll encounter this. And what does this tell you? What does this tell you? Think about, think about what it means to scale the time argument in a signal. If I have a signal x, and I scale the argument by a positive number a, form a signal y equals x of a t. What happens if a is a big positive number? What does y look like versus x? So if I have x and I define y by y of t equals x of 10 to the 59th t, what does that do to the graph of x? Yeah, it constricts it, exactly. So a bigger than 1, if, you take, if this is the graph of x, then square root of a, x of a t, is going to be a taller, narrower version of the graph of x, right? a less than 1 going to 0, square root of a, x of a, t, is going to be a flatter, more squished out version of the graph of x. And while that's happening over here in the time domain, the opposite is happening over in the omega domain. If I crank a, right, this becomes taller and narrower, and this becomes flatter and more spread out. If I crank a down towards 0, the opposite, right? Where do you think the crossover occurs? Is there a functional form that has the same mushiness slash sharpness in both the time and the frequency domain? I think I told you guys this last spring in 2200, but I forget whether I did. So maybe people who weren't in that class, see if you can guess. Yeah, Maroon. Zero is an example, yes. <laughs> but that, let, let's go for non-zero. Let's go for non-zero. 
Stephen. Yeah, Gaussian. Gaussian. So it turns out that the crossover point is Gaussian. That is to say, if you have something that's Gaussian in T, that turns out to have a Fourier transform that's also Gaussian in omega. And that's a problem that's going to be on the homework. I'm going to step you through a proof of that. And, and it's not exactly e to the minus t squared over 2 goes to e to the minus omega squared over 2. There's some constants in there. But the functional form is the key here. The classic bell-shaped curve goes Fourier transform-wise with that. And if you were Aaron Wagner, one of our awesome professors, you, would, you wouldn't say Gaussian. You would say Gaussian. He, he says it's very careful to say Gaussian. Okay, but I say Gaussian. How many people say Gaussian versus Gaussian? 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 Okay. Probably depends on where you got your secondary education, whatever, yeah? Well, A could be negative, but I'm only stating this rule for A bigger than zero. If A is negative, then there's some absolute values that go into that formula, but this is a much simpler. And when we talk about wavelets, A is always going to be positive. It's always going to be a power of two. Okay, so th those are some generalities about Fourier transforms. There's other stuff, you know, there's this thing called the Plancherelle theorem, Parseval, whatever, all these things are in the monograph. But now what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about Fourier transforms and LTI systems. Okay, so how does this go? Uh, as, you, as you can imagine, the convolution rule is going to be what comes into play here and makes it happen. First off, we've actually kind of met casually before the Fourier transform in a slightly different context. Okay, you may have noticed that equation script F for the Fourier transformer signal looks an awful lot like what we had for computing the frequency response of an LTI system that has a frequency response. So you may have noticed that equation F looks like the formula for frequency response. And to state exactly what that was, let me remind you that if a linear time, in, time invariant system with impulse response S, a, a, H, has a frequency response, H hat, then H hat of omega is given by the following formula. Integral from minus infinity to infinity, and I'll write it exactly the way we had it before. We had H of tau e to the minus j omega tau d tau for all omega. That is equation script f for the signal h. And to summarize that, The frequency response of a system, and when I say of a system, I mean of a linear time invariant system that has a frequency response, is the Fourier transform of the systems impulse response.
And furthermore, for a system that has a frequency response, equation script F holds for that Fourier transform pair. So N, you can find it using equation script F. All right, so frequency response is the Fourier transform of the impulse response. So now we have two ways of computing the frequency response for a system that has one. So thus, two ways to find frequency response of a system. And depending on how the system is presented to you, one of these ways might be easier than the other. First method was one we've talked about already. You put in e to the j omega t, and what comes out is necessarily equal to h hat of omega, e to the j omega t. So e to the j omega t goes into the system, and what is going to come out is h hat of omega, e to the j omega t. And that's how we found the frequency response of all of our example systems, the shift, the averager, and all that kind of thing. This is true for all omega. The other way to do it is find the system's impulse response if you don't have it already and take the Fourier transform of that. So find the system's impulse response H. and take the Fourier transform. OK, so those are two ways to find the frequency response of a linear time invariant system that has a frequency response. OK, so what else? Furthermore, suppose a system has a frequency response. So suppose your system system has impulse response H and frequency response H hat, which is the Fourier transform of H. And suppose that little x is some signal in script D sub H, and x has a Fourier transform x hat. So x has a Fourier transform x hat. By the convolution rule for Fourier transforms, what do we have? The output y equals s of x, which is h convolved with x, has Fourier transform. y hat equals h hat x hat. Now, what I'm thinking about here in this furthermore paragraph is I'm thinking about a signal x that has a nice continuous kind of looking Fourier transform. I'm not thinking about things that have deltas in them. You can make this work for, for example, x being a pure complex sinusoid by being very careful about bookkeeping your deltas. But I'm thinking more here about x's that have sort of smooth Fourier transforms. Okay. So we're thinking here mostly of when x hat isn't delta infested. It's smoothish. Okay. So what does this tell us? What does this tell us? What is x hat supposed to tell us about x? What is it? Well, it tells us everything about x. It's just like looking at x from a different angle. But what x hat does, at least I've tried to pitch this to you with a finite dimensional, a finite duration A440 example, is exhibits, it exhibits the frequency content of x in some sense. 
So since x hat and y hat are sort of like the frequency content of x and y, this equation y hat equals h hat x hat in some sense is telling us that what the system is doing is it's taking the frequency content of y and morphing it, reshaping it by means of the frequency response of the system to give you, or, or sorry, it takes the frequency content of x and morphs it, reshapes it by this product there into the frequency content of the output. So thus, the system by means of y hat equals h hat x hat in some sense reshapes the frequency content of x into that of y. And that reshaping is mediated by the frequency response h hat. So not only does the frequency response tell us what the system does to individual sinusoids of a fixed frequency. That's the way we learned about frequency response originally. That's where we introduced it. It also tells us how the system operates on the frequency content of more general inputs to give you the frequency content of the output. So if h hat of omega is small in some omega range, that tends to crush down the frequency content of x in that range. If it's big, it tends to amplify it, that kind of thing. Okay, so. That's what the frequency response does. And so again, we can think of the frequency response as we can think via the frequency response of any LTI system that has a frequency response as being a frequency selective filter. It tends to crush down certain frequencies and amplify others. Okay. There are three extreme examples of this. So three, we, so thus, an LTI system with a frequency response acts as a quote-unquote filter. Okay, so what are some extreme examples? We, we saw these in EC2200, and I'm sure whoever, whoever taught you EC2200 taught you about these. Remember what they were, the three flavors of ideal filters? So some ideal examples. The ideal low-pass filter. This is what its frequency response looks like. It's one over some range of frequencies, say, out to plus and minus omega 2. And the ideal high pass is going to be something like this. It's going to be 1 outside of some frequency plus or minus omega 1. And the ideal band pass. These are frequency responses I'm graphing, as you probably know. That's going to be 1 in between omega 1 and omega 2 and 0 otherwise. OK, now there's names for all these things like the omega 2 and omega 1 are called cutoff frequencies. And in the case of the bandpass, omega 1 is the low frequency cutoff, omega 2 is the high frequency cutoff. The, the things that 
are where it's one, that's the pass band. The frequencies where it's zero, that's the stop band. These are all terminologies you've seen before. I won't go listing them on the board now. First off, why are these not physically realizable? Why can't you build a continuous time LTI system that has one of these as its frequency response? There is a simple answer. So it turns out you can't build a system, at least in the universe as we currently understand it, whether that be a you know, relativistic, quantum mechanical universe, or some combination thereof. You can't build a system to implement any of these. Because any such system would be non-causal. And non-causal things in the current, our current understanding of the universe are not allowed, are not physically buildable. Why? Why does it have to be non-causal? Remember last time we did an example? Let's consider, just consider the low pass. And of course, by the way, you know, the kind of thing I always worry about, there's disagreement in the literature about whether low pass is one word or hyphenated or two words. Same with band pass, same with high pass. We saw last time that if you have h hat of omega that looks like this, then h of t is going to look like this. It's going to be a sync function. Thus, the system that implements any frequency response that looks like that, including the one that's 1 between plus and minus omega 2 and 0 otherwise, is going to have a sync function as its impulse response. And h of t is non-zero, so it's, it isn't 0 for all t less than 0. That means the system is non-causal. And that was our simple criterion for causality of a linear time invariant system. Okay. Same holds for those others. Easy to prove. What do these ideal filters do to various inputs? We can consider separately what they do to pure complex sinusoids and more general inputs. And after I've done that, we'll take the three-minute break. And I'm going to write myself a little note here. There. So how do these filters process pure sinusoids? Suppose I put a sinusoid of frequency, say, omega 0, through one of these filters. So let x have specification, x of t equals e to the j omega 0 t for all t. Let's use x as an input to one of these ideal filters. What comes out?
What if I put it in the, in the low pass filter? What if I use e to the j omega 0t as the input to the low pass filter? What comes out? Be brave. Come on. Manish. Yeah, and it's actually omega rather than sigma. But you know, right. you've got the right language, <laughs> just the wrong letter. Yeah. Yes, so Manish says that if you put e to the j omega 0 t for all t, if you put that input signal into the low pass up there, then It'll just go right through unadulterated if omega 0 is in between plus and minus omega 2. And it will be annihilated if omega is outside of there. Right? Everybody get that? It's because of that picture. E to the j omega t goes into a system. Then what comes out is going to be h hat of omega, e to the j omega t. So if omega is where the thing is 1, it comes out. If omega is where the thing is 0, 0 comes out. Same for the other filters. So if you use it as an input, if you use X as an input to one of these filters, the output is either X itself or the zero signal. And what determines whether it's X itself or the zero signal is whether omega zero lies in the range of frequencies where the frequency response is equal to 1. So it's x comes out if and only if omega 0 is in the range of frequencies where h hat of omega equals 1. And that's true for any of the filters. Otherwise, if omega 0 is in the range of frequencies for, where, for which h hat of omega is equal to 0, the 0 signal comes out. How does the filter process more general inputs? So these filters process more general inputs. So more general Fourier transformable inputs. as follows. The output Y will have Fourier transform y hat with specification y hat of omega equals either x hat of omega or 0, depending on whether omega lies in the passband or the stop band of the filter. So this is for omega values where h hat of omega equals 1. And this is for omega values, where h hat of omega equals 0. In other words, what the filters do, what these ideal filters do, is they pass unadulterated the frequency content of x that lies in the range where the filter frequency response is equal to 1. And it kills the frequency content in x for the frequencies where h hat of omega is equal to 0. OK, so this is ideal filters. This is how they act both on pure sinusoids and on more general inputs. And have a little more to say about that after the break. And for now, what I'm going to do, for those of you who got here late, Nathan, hi. <laughs> and you're not the only one. Um, I, I was unable to record the prelims at lunchtime because the internet was down in Cafe Pacific. So I'm going to finish recording the grades. And then we'll see what we do about handing them back. So, so you can talk among yourselves for a couple minutes. Because you came to class. Uh, who, other, who else never comes but just came to get their test? Oh, no, you're always there. OK. Anybody want to ask a quick question about the test now? 
Um, yes? Two on number one is a is actually uh, I think it's a direct replay of one of the ones on last year's exam. That's the definition of a mapping. X is unique. That's right. That's right. For if you if if I give you a, you have only one answer for f of a. I thought by you a unique element. Each A maps to a unique B. That's now, correct. I guess rather that no two A's can map to the same. No, that's not, that's not what that says. It's not mean. It's the definition of a mapping. It's the word it's, unique that... Yes. <laughs> unique means... Unique means... Okay, let, let, me say it, let me say it slowly and with feeling. For every A in A, there's a unique B in B, such that B equals F of A. There's an unambiguous destination for every A. That's what a mapping is. Got it? I know, Brian, you, you, you want to criticize that? No? Well, what if, I, what if I wrote, for every A and A, there's one and only one B and B for which B equals F of A. Would that be any more? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Really? Unique makes it seem like it's... It is unique in B. Injective mapping is when you say that. I never used the word unique when we talked about injective. When we t I deliberately didn't use that word. I said... It's injective whenever two different A's always map to two different B's. That's, I try not to use, so, so t the only way to use unique when you define injective is to say for, for every B that gets mapped to, there's a unique A that maps to it. We never said that. We never said that in class. So anyway, Balazs. Why is 4, 4, 4 like true? It's not. So if I marked that wrong, if you circled it and I marked it wrong, that's a mistake in grading. Um, because P would have to divide either E or D. Well, what if E, D equals P? That would still hold the E, D of P minus 1 equals 1. Um, e, D can't be P because P is prime. That's why P can't be 1 to large. Yeah, basic, the, the, this is the way I was thinking of doing it. P divides E, D means P either divides E or P divides D. That's a property of primeness. And since E and D are both less than P, that's not possible. Okay. Any other? Yeah, Alex. The one I couldn't figure out is 4 in item 3, or problem 3, item 4. <laughs> that is true if A is prime, but I cannot prove that A has to be prime for that to be true. And I don't know what I was thinking when I wrote that question because, you know, I looked through all my notes and records and everything and I, I never used that on a previous exam or, you know, so I honestly, I, I don't know what I was thinking. What I did manage to prove is that for that to be true, then phi of A has to be a divisor of A minus 1, but that's all I can show, phi of A being the Euler phi function. So I gave everybody that one. It's only fair. Did anyone figure it out? Is it a hard counterexample? Okay, good. Because I went up all the way up to like 19, I think, at CTB. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you for, for at least, see, see the, the, one of the things about these modular arithmetic results is if they're true, they're generally really easy to prove. The fact that I could not prove that to myself made me think it's not true. But I couldn't find a counterexample. You know, so it was like I was racking my brains about that last night when I ran into you guys. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, Harry. Seven two. If the sequence, this is a sequence of rational numbers between minus pi and pi. 
And it says, if it converges to a limit x bar, then x bar is strictly greater than minus pi. I claim that they could converge to pi minus pi. But it says rational. It's rational. Oh, right, because the sequence is rational, but it approaches an irrational. Yeah, that's po it's possible for a rational sequence to approach an irrational number. S say that a little louder. No, no, not quite. Cauchy sequences are ones that get closer and closer together. Convergent sequences are ones that go somewhere. And in the, in the case of real numbers, that's the same notion. Now, the thing is, there's, there's a, in class, we had a sequence of rational numbers that approach pi. 3, 3.1, 3.14, 3.1, and so on. Now, if you do the, like the negative version of that, you get a sequence of numbers that can approach minus pi. <coughs> Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay. Well, check my check my edition again and make sure that if there, you know if I marked it incorrectly, then we fix it and all that stuff. <coughs> and I'll send out an email with the stats on the test afterward. Okay. So th this is. Back to this for the last few minutes, you know, we're talking about these filters. Think of any LTI system with a frequency response as a filter. These are the ideal filters. And while we were talking about this a few minutes ago, I remembered there was one thing, one thing I wanted to mention when we were talking about the Heisenberg stuff that I forgot to mention. So <laughs> let me throw that in. before we talk about things like linear phase filters and stuff. So here's one thing I forgot to mention. And this is very important uh, terminology that we're going to be using as we go forward. So OK, so, so here's an aside. Forgot to mention the following terminology. So we say a signal x with Fourier transform x hat is band limited. And this is another one of those words that's either two words or a hyphenated word or one word. I always write it as one word. When there exists some, let's call it omega 0, bigger than 0, such that x hat of omega is 0 when omega is bigger than that in absolute value. So all of the frequency content of the signal x lies between plus and minus omega 0. The bandwidth of x, so in this case, the bandwidth of x is given by the following formula. And, and this is an example where, given the notation terminology and notions that we develop in this class that are a little above and beyond 2200, we can give a precise definition of bandwidth. Is omega m, let's call it omega m, equals the inf of the set of all omega zeros such that x hat of omega equals zero for all omega bigger than or equal to omega zero. So omega m is, in some sense, the smallest encapsulation of all the activity in x hat. So colloquially speaking, all frequency content of x lies in the frequency 
band minus omega m up to omega n. Okay, that's what it means for a signal to be band limited. And band limited signals we can say a lot more about than we can about signals that aren't band limited. And by the way, if, if X isn't, doesn't have a nice smooth Fourier transform, if it has deltas in it, like if X is a superposition of sinusoids or something, this definition still works. Okay, so note this definition still works. Or I should say it just works even when x hat has one or more deltas in it. That is to say when x itself has one or more pure sinusoidal components. Okay, now there's a kind of a sharp version of Heisenberg's thing that goes along with the concept of bandwidth, band limitedness. And it goes like this. And there's a proof of this in the monograph. First off, when when you think about signals, what's the, what's the kind of a signal property that's sort of like band limited? In the frequency domain, it means that the frequency content is all between some range. What would a time domain version that looks sort of like that be? Yeah. Yeah, finite duration. Said like an expert. <laughs> of course, he is an expert, so. Anyway, um, yeah, so you might wonder, OK, if we have sharp and focused in time goes to mushy and spread out in frequency and vice versa, how, how does finite duration relate to band limited? Well, you can make that precise as follows. Here's a fact. Let x be a non-zero signal. When I say non-zero, I don't mean it's never zero. I mean x be a signal, not the zero signal. So let's be really careful about that. And suppose it has Fourier transform x hat. Then, if x is fine, finite duration, if x has finite duration, x is not band limited. If x is band limited, then x does not have finite duration. <laughs> Another way of saying this is that the only Fourier transformable signal that both has finite duration and is band limited is the zero signal. It's another way of saying it. But this is the more, I think, information packed way of saying it. So there's no way you can have a finite duration signal that's band limited. There's no way you can have a, a, a band limited signal that has infinite duration. Yeah, David. Yeah, that, that's good intuition there. You know, the, it, when, you, when you're boxing the frequency content, it turns out that's the same as convolving with a sync function in the time domain, and that tends to mush things out s somehow. So yeah. But this is, this is actually a fairly elementary result to prove, you know, given some regularity conditions on things. And it's, it's a popular, popular result, and everybody knows it. So anyway, well, we'll leave it at that for today and pick it up next time. <laughs>